Hello and welcome to Type on Thursday, let's say, <laughs> with me, Hannah. And today I am really excited to finally give you the sort of rundown and my takeaway points from last week's EASD 2020 conference that I was so fortunate to uh, attend as part of the DDoc Voices. Um, and I was very, very happy that I got accepted into the scholarship program. So happy I got the chance to attend EASD 2020 in its virtual form uh, because there are so many interesting things being said and being talked about and being discussed. And I'm really, really happy uh, that the patient voice is starting to become a little bit more recognized uh, with the help of DDoc voices, for example and so that we get a chance to hear the information from the source and that we can ask questions and make sure that uh, there is a thought of that there is an end user uh, in all these treatments that are discussed and ideas and tools and tips and tricks and all this stuff well not so much tips and tricks actually never mind attending a conference like EASD um, is actually quite intense I have to say and I it was my first time attending a specifically diabetes scientific conference. So I was very um, overwhelmed at times in terms of what to choose and what sessions to attend and what to focus on. So I did a broad array of, uh, of uh, sessions and a broad array of topics. So that's why my <laughs> takeaways are maybe a little, you know, it's a little bit like raisins in the cake, proverbial ones, but nonetheless, I discovered a lot of interesting things and I saw I think I saw a couple of themes and trends so let's go to that right now. So you should always start with the positives, right? <laughs> Cuz while it was a fantastic conference, it, I did have a few reservations, but I'll get to those after. Uh, first of all, let's go through the plus points, the positive ones, the ones that surprised me, inspired me, and made me feel a little bit more hopeful for the future of diabetes science. And that was, for example, that there was uh, surprisingly actually much talk about ketones and ketones as fuel and ketosis, not maybe in especially towards the type 1, although there was one study that had uh, had investigated uh, what did they call it? They called it individual carb levels uh, in type 1 diabetics who are using a hybrid closed loop, which was actually a study from here in Switzerland, which was really interesting. So that was sort of the only low carb thing with uh, in regards to type 1, and they weren't really that, I mean, they were 100 grams a day, so it wasn't super low carb, but you know, it's a step in the right direction. But there was uh, there were sessions on ketosis and how to use, ke that the body can, that that was acknowledged, use ketones for uh, fuel. So that was a really nice. Another thing that was actually quite widely talked about was the role of epigenetics. So we have our genetics that we are born with, but epigenetics are sort of the ones that we can influence with the help of our lifestyle. So with food, with movement, with stress management, all of these things that I normally yap on about so much, you, we can actually steer part of our uh, genetics um, and switch certain genes off and on with the help of lifestyle measures and that co that can influence your epigenetics and actually uh, there was a lot of talk about epigenetics and especially the role of epigenetics in diabetic complications because this was of course as always a big topic and it was interesting to see that we do have you know a say in what happens to our future um, and in our genes and in our bodies and we can to a certain extent, of course, not completely, but to a certain extent, we can control it a little bit at least. Hand in hand with epigenetics is actually that it, there was talk about genetic profiling in type 1 diabetes to potentially in the future tailor the treatment uh, according to different subtypes of diabetes. And these genetic subtypes of diabetes, um, they are really becoming more and more prevalent and to really, we, I don't think we can uh, sort of discard them for that much longer because it is a huge area that is maybe not so well researched yet, but I think it could be. And if we can get more targeted uh, treatments and more targeted 
advice given, more individualized, which is my next point, um, that really uh, could point to a better way of managing diabetes in the future. With that, there was, and this is sort of a point that I took from all the five days where I, you know, listened in and I talked to people and I communicated with, with others and all of this stuff. It was a lot about, uh, a lot of talk about, for example, health literacy. So in terms of how uh, well you understand health and, and sort of the consequences of your treatment sort of thing, and also the potential chances and, and, and benefits of them. There was a lot of talk about communication and how that can definitely be improved, uh, both sort of from all angles of healthcare, but also from the patient side, from the from the doctor's side, from the research side, from the provider side, all these, and I'm sure also insurers and all those payers and, and things. It was a huge point to acknowledge that yes, communication within diabetes care and diabetes management can be definitely improved on. Also words like individualized, also words like personalization, um, stuff like that when it comes to diabetes care, that it was really acknowledged that that is the future. And this also of course goes with the previous point of the genetic side. It sort of gives us a chance to break free from the blanket statements of, oh, yes, you have diabetes and you should do this, this, and this. No, maybe this, this, and this isn't enough for some people, or maybe it's too much for other people. We really have to see the patient as, and the, the person with diabetes, living with diabetes, as an individual rather than a blanket statement, um, because that's the way it should be. And I think that's very dangerous in all areas, but especially when it comes to life-sustaining medications and uh, people with diabetes. Also terms like beyond medicine were mentioned, which is, you know, for, for someone who's worked closer to 10 years within sort of health and lifestyle, this is extraordinary. I don't know, of course, this was my first uh, specifically diabetes conference like that in a scientific setting, but just the fact that that is also bubbling up to the surface uh, made me very, very happy and uh, very excited to see uh, that that is uh, happening. I also heard things like integrated diabetes care, which goes hand in hand with the lifestyle stuff and the beyond medicine and personalization, individualized, you know, all of it. Um, and also lifestyle, also heard that in a few talks and presentations. And the big one, which I think is the biggest, biggest one, which goes hand in hand with health literacy, and that is education. Um, so that, you know, that there is a focus in that education is so important when it comes to diabetes management, both for the patient, but also from the patient side to the doctor. Sometimes we have to teach the doctors what, what works for us. Sometimes the doctors need to teach us what, you know, should be working for us, but it's up to us to, to um, take it on. Anyway, that's a topic for a different time. I think a lot of my not so positive sides <laughs> that I heard at EASD um, could actually come down to education. I also really, really loved getting to know uh, new people. I loved getting to know fellow people with diabetes. I love to get to know things that they're talking about. And also, of course, I loved getting to know new companies, new tools for diabetes, um, new solutions and all of that stuff. So it was very, very interesting. And they had built up a whole like online uh, fair thing that you had a little avatar and it looked like the Sims from the 90s. But you know, it was very cute and you could choose your outfit and you could, you know, communicate with people. You could even call people through that program. So it was very cool. And, but definitely as with every conference experience that I have, which is starting to be quite a few now a days, uh, it's always, always the people that make it uh, what it is, not necessarily the topics. Not everything can be sunshine, rainbows and unicorn farts. Uh, even at EASD 2020, I have some questions or concerns or questions despite everything i just said about you know health literacy and communication and all this stuff i have to say that the patient perspective and uh, the expertise that us patients with chronic illnesses actually have and sit on it wasn't acknowledged as much as i maybe would have hoped it's bubbling up and i know i'm very um I, I, I'm not the person with the most patience in the world, but 
Um, I had hoped that this patient voice would have been a little bit more appreciated than it was in certain sessions. Uh, and maybe that was, you know, up to me. Maybe that was just my um, interpretation. I also realized that because there was a lot of presentations on different loop looping systems, um, not the, well, not so much the DIY ones, of course, because there you can uh, sort of set your goal range on your own. But from the big brands, the FDA approved uh, loops and stuff. I realized that they can't do anything for me right now. And I wonder, I can't be alone in this feeling that I would not be happy with those kind of ranges that they are uh, boasting about and proposing and, and, and suggesting. Um, because frankly, I can do it better myself. And then why um, actually go with the looping system. I'm sure these will improve in the future, but for right now, I don't see a personal uh, use for a loop system. But yeah, we'll see what comes in the future. Another thing was that time in range was the bell of the ball. It was the rage of whatever. It was everywhere. In very many presentations, uh, time in range was discussed. And I understand, I mean, why not use such a powerful tool in a scientific setting as a CGM? Because it shows you real time and you don't have to prick people all the time. It's ingenious. And that also gives you, of course, access to time in range data. And, you know, again, in my opinion, I feel like these time in range goal frames are just set too high. As you may know, I'm a big, big, big believer in that every person with diabetes can and should try to achieve um, healthy, happy, healing blood sugars of a normal range, like a normal, healthy person has, because it is possible. You just have to find your way. That's also a, a thing for another session. But bearing this in mind, seeing these time and ranges uh, that companies and, and researchers were, were showing, it was a little mind bo boggling to me how this, you know, was a good thing to have a range between 3.9 and 10, which is 70, about 70 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. And how this was, you know, amazing. And the kicker in this whole thing is people can't even reach these. And this is where I really think that education has more to play, uh, a bigger role to play than the treatment itself. We have the treatment. The treatment is there. We have the tools. We have the medication. We have, um, I mean, insulin. That's it. That's, that's what's keeping us alive. And I don't think necessarily that we need new treatments, but we need more education of how to use these tools, of what to do with it, how to uh, keep your blood sugar in range, even the, the big range of 3.9 to 10 or, you know, up to 180. One presenter said that, you know, being 60% time in range between 3.9 and 10, so up to 180, uh, is great. And I'm like, where are you the other 40% of the time? The same researcher also called that um, levels between 10, so 180, and 14, which is 2, 4, 6, 8, another 80, <laughs> which is, you know, 260. Um, that is, you know, mild hyperglycemia. I don't, I, I mean, I have been there in my days before, but... And I used to be there daily, but with more education and with more tools to help, things should get better. There was also a presentation by a particular pump manufacturer, and they boasted about that their average A1C level of their users was 8.1%. Like, what? My A1Cs have been in the double digits, they have been everywhere across the board, but I don't think I thought I was doing well when I had an A1C of 8.1%. Maybe I'm just too hard on myself, and I know a lot of people think that, and that's fine, but for me, it's just simply not good enough, because, I, as I said, I do believe in that every person with diabetes 
is entitled actually with all the tools and with all the knowledge that is out there just maybe not applied in the best way yet but with all of that it is possible and it should be possible to have normal blood sugars because if you think about it where do these weird ranges come from why is 180 as an upper level you know commonly recognized as a good idea for a person with diabetes because if you think about it, if a healthy person has blood sugars up to 180, they're diabetic. They're no longer healthy. And with the goal of wanting to live a healthy, long, happy, uh, active, engaging life, being up about double, triple, whatever, of a normal range, I don't think is going to get us there. But who am I? I'm no researcher. I am just a lay person with my own thoughts and reactions. Do let me know what you think about this. What is your goal range uh, for time in range? Um, it'd be interesting to know that. Thank you so much for hanging out with me talking about EASD today. And I'll see you next time.